Let's get into our study in the book of Ephesians. Open up with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter number 6. Um, I'm excited. We're going to finish Ephesians 6 soon and get right into the book of Philippians then go right into Colossians. So we're into some meat of the word here. In Philippians chapter number 6, uh, this is part 2 of parents and children. Uh, let me start off by saying we're going to talk about fathers today. And um, first and foremost, this is not to condemn anyone. It's, it's to actually encourage fathers. I'm a father. No, no fathers do everything 100% right. But what you want to do from this moment on is to redeem the time being a godly father. Many of you guys know uh, my, my father, Buddy, here. And we worked together for a number of years, the majority of my life. And I praise the Lord for him. He has decided to desire to, and, 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 and although we're adults, you know, I'm an adult now, he's decided to uh, give his life over to, to helping uh, me heal from the time that we missed all those years. And so I'm, I'm thankful to God for him. And this, this is the grace of God that he's with me. Mm -hmm. and, and there are many fathers here. I look to see Jim, Joe, uh, Jonathan, myself, buddy. Uh, you know, and there's many fathers out there. And I want to record this so this will be on our site so that it can encourage fathers. You know, you don't need Father's Day to honor and encourage fathers. Again, this study is not to condemn. It's just to show the truth of the father. Fathers are the most important people on earth. Not grace pastors. You know, I always tell Krista, my job as a grace minister, I have the most unique, peculiar, precious job on earth, a minister of the grace message. There aren't too many of us. Where grace believers are really one in a million, then even of that group, good, faithful grace minister. But I can't do for you what your father can do. And I'm talking about even lost fathers. The, the dynamic of a father, God himself is called God the what? Father. So obviously, when God takes on the title or description as Father, even the Messiah of Israel, the Lord Jesus, uh, Isaiah says in Isaiah 9, the, the everlasting Father, there's, there's a characteristic of being a father, and we're going to see that. Fathers are the most important people on earth. Because the moment children are conceived and, and born into this world, the person that has the greatest effect on them is their father. Brother Leonard here, he's not here tonight because of physical infirmity. He's in his 60s. Brother James Mason, who died, and I did his funeral back in May in, in Minnesota, who's in, who was in his 60s. Both of them had great mothers and fathers. Their mothers and fathers were believers, taught them. Both of those men said, Ron, we lo I love my mother, but nobody was like my dad. They remember their dad. They remember their dad from the time they were a little boy. Both of them said that. They said, I'm going to be happy to see my mother when I get to heaven, but I want to see my dad. Both of them. James is with his father now. So I just want you to see that God has made it that way. In the book of Proverbs, it says that the glory of children are their fathers. God put a spiritual connection because your father is to be God in your life. The way you're going to see God is how your father shows you who God is. Your fathers can affect your view of God, either positive or negative. Whether you're a male or female, all boys need their fathers. And I'm talking from experience here. There's not a baseball player, football player. I watch little boys. I watch grown men. And they say, how did you become who you are? My dad. Who's your hero? My dad. Tiger Woods, two years old. His father, Earl, teaching him. He says, my dad. Dads have profound effect on their boys. Who do you look up to? Your dad. Even on their girls. Girls get promiscuous and so forth. In the black community, it's... The boys are angry, lack of fathers. The, the girls are promiscuous at a young age, lack of father's involvement. Even if there's a father there, he might be absentee. So fathers, we have such a great, we, I'm a father, I have a five-year-old girl. We have such a grave responsibility from the Lord. We joke, uh, I, I'm from Chicago, as you all know, and when we moved to Minnesota, my teams, the Chicago Bears, go against the Minnesota Vikings. My, fam my, my wife's family is all Minnesota Vikings and Minnesota Twins fans. I'm a White Sox fan. And they were they trying to get my daughter to root for the Minnesota team. I say, mm -mm, not going to happen. Because whatever daddy tells her, now they you know, she, but whatever daddy tells her to do, she's going to do. I don't even, uh, Krista's father, John, says, I'm going to teach your daughter to root for uh, my team. I go, you can say all you want. She listens to me. I'm daddy. See, Daddies have a profound effect. So again, this study tonight, because we're going to look at what Paul in the Word of God says about a father. Fathers use this opportunity to redeem the time. 
If you weren't the best father in the past, be it now. Okay? Even if your children have grown, be it now. Because the glory of children are their fathers and it never changes. I work with seniors. I work with 90-year-old men and women. You would be surprised, now you wouldn't, how many of these, I have 90-year-old women telling me they remember one lady named Carol. She, she's from Texas. She moved back to Texas, but she came here for a span of years. She's 90 years old. She grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. She told me she remembers going to the Cleveland Browns games. They're way back. And it's an outdoor stadium. It was, she says, it was 30 below wind chills that day. It was a Sunday. She went to the game with her dad. And she said, Ron, I wasn't worried about the cold weather, whatever. My dad, I was five years old, and my dad put me right in his lap and covered me, and we had a great time at the game. The woman's 90. She remembers something from 85 years ago, a Cleveland Browns game or whatever, that she went with her dad. The effects of dads. So let's examine what the Word of God, again, it's not to condemn, it's to encourage. It's to, it's to uh, for the fathers here and who are listening, it's to encourage. For the mothers too, for the children. We're going to see what the Word of God has to say. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. As we were talking about grace in the home, we already saw husbands and wives. Now God goes, to the, God goes through Paul to the fathers. Now, I want you to see some things about this passage. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There's a lot there. By the way, notice he didn't talk about mothers. Um, the, the fallacy of, of, of life is that mothers are the ones who are to raise the children. Now, mothers are the ones who are there to, to nurse the children and, and take care of them and so forth, obviously, the natural um, affection. Uh, she's going to be the one who births the child and, and feeds the child, you know, breastfeed and nurse and so forth. But the one who is in charge of the discipline, the teaching of the child is the father. You know, it is said that God never has to tell a mother to love her child. Well, that's just, that's not true from Scripture. Um, there is something called without natural affection. There are mothers who don't naturally love their children. That's just a fact. God has to tell women to love their children. Go to, over to Titus chapter number 2. Go over to Ch Titus 2. Uh, you probably heard it's been said that you know, God doesn't have to tell mothers to, to how to deal with their children. Well, he does. Because mothers are, even though the natural uh, tendency that God put in the woman is to care for the child, sin, the sin nature and the curse has... Uh, you've heard of women uh, killing their children and so forth, you know, and there, there are many women who don't love their children. You have to be told to love your child the way God says to love them. Look at uh, Titus chapter 2 and verse number um, 3, some instruction. The aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becoming holiness. Um, Paul tells the aged women, here's how you behave. Behave as a woman who is holy, a holy woman. How? Not false accusers, don't make stuff up about others, not giving them much wine and so forth. Teachers of good things. Okay? You, your job is to teach. Teach who? Verse 4. That they may teach the young women to be sober. He's not talking about as far as not drunk, you know, clear, uh, clear thinking, pro have proper thinking. The older woman is to say, uh, honey, this is how you need to think about this. I have a history with this over the course of time. This is the way life works. And, and I don't notice, to love their husbands. So, so God through Paul tells a woman to love her husband. Now watch this, verse 4, to what? Love their children. So God does command a woman to love her children. Goes on to be, be discreet. That means don't put your business all out on the street. Be discreet, chaste, chaste uh, talk about control your, your, your desires, be modest and so forth, pure. Keepers at home, don't be out busy body and going from house to house, as Paul says. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Uh, going against those things will blaspheme God's word. 
Because people are going to say, you call yourself a Christian, you out there, you gossiping just like the rest. I don't want to be part of that. Okay? So I just want you to see, but women, there are instructions on women on how to love their husbands, love their children. But when it comes to the discipline of the child, that's all the man. Now, if that's true from Scripture, which we're going to see it is, what happens when that man is not there? You got total chaos and destruction. Amen. Okay? I grew up in the hood in, in Inglewood, Chicago. And these single parent homes where the mother is in charge, not happening. When the fathers are not there, the boys, that's why they end up in gangs and, and in prison and stuff. It's, 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 they're angry. They're just, it's just they don't have males to control them. Men, boys need men. About the age of 12, when the boys start, testosterone start flowing, his mother can't do a thing with him. He will not listen to her. Now, he can be kind and, and be respectful and so forth. But in his mind, he's thinking, who is this woman telling me to do whatever? God made it that way. Not to disrespect her, but not to be under the authority of a woman. By the time a boy turns 15, three years of testosterone, you can't stop him. I remember being 15 and my mother told me something. I was like, I, I got to tell you, I'm 15, you know. I was a senior high school. I'm on the phone with Keisha, you know, hey girl, what's up? My mother said, oh, Pappy, can you get off the phone and take the garbage out? I said, yeah, yeah, I'll do it in a minute. Hey, what's up, girl? Yeah. She said, no, I'll do it now. I said, I did, I'll do it in a minute. Now, I don't know why I did this. I do. I was young and stupid. You feel <laughs> testosterone. And all I saw was a broom coming at me like that. <laughs> and I looked, I grabbed the broom. Sorry, mother. I grabbed the broom and I said, look, woman, you don't, you don't want to be doing this. I was crazy. I was young, okay? But I'm like, what? This broom, I'm going, you just don't hurt yourself. Because I was 15, I was playing football, baseball, you know, I was a testosterone kid. She couldn't do a thing with me. Now, thankfully, my personality and my grandmother's old school, it, it, but you don't want to have to have your wife dealing with your boys that way. No. It is the father's responsibility. My first ministry job was a youth minister because dear sister Charlotte, back in Chicago, she couldn't handle the young boys at a certain age. Once they hit about 11, 12, they wouldn't listen to her. I had no problem with them. In fact, they would sit at attention. They wanted a man. They wanted a man. They want that male. And the greatest man in a child's life is their father. Now, he says, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Now, let's look at fathers. A father's responsibility is to discipline the child. Hold your hand here. Go over to Colossians 3. Uh, when we look at Ephesians, you know we're going to look at Colossians, their spousal epistles, they go together. Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, a couple, couple of books over. Now mind you, man, as I teach this, I'm speaking to myself, I'm a father. All these instructions, when I do that, that me too. Um, notice here, think about why God calls himself a father. A father is to care for, is to provide, is to discipline, to leave a legacy and inheritance to their children. We're going to go over a few of those in a moment. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, because those are all the things God the Father does. Colossians 3, 21. Fathers, provoke. Oh, that word provoke, it's not a good word. It's, you know, you know, if you have children, people have multiple children, they provoke each other. You know, start poking and messing with stuff, provoke. He's messing with me. You know, they purposely trying to, to get under someone's skin. It, it has to do with getting under someone's skin, as it were. Uh, Paul says his ministry was given by Almighty God, including the signs and wonders, to provoke Israel to jealousy, right? To provoke them to emulation. He, his ministry there in the beginning, uh, during the transition period of Acts, was to provoke Israel. As Israel saw that the signs of Almighty God, their God, wasn't with them, but he's with the Gentiles through Paul, they were to say, hey, wait a minute, God's not with us. We need to find out from Paul what to do, and that's to get into the body of Christ. Trust Christ. Trust Jesus Christ, right? Provoking. It, it, it has to do with lighting a fire on them. It, 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 it's, it's, it's getting them to react. And what a father is to do is not to get his children to react in this way. Notice it says, Colossians 3.21, fathers, Provoke not your children to what? Anger. Anger. Let me tell you something. Growing up in the, in the hood in Chicago, a lot of angry young men, and number one cause is their fathers weren't there, are not there, don't love, them, haven't been there. I'm just telling you. I, I dealt with that. I didn't take it to the extreme like most of them. 
But it's in you. It's in there. It's, it's, it's anger. And by the way, this anger will play its way out, okay? Now, that's, it, it, what, even, even if your father's there, I've talked to men, white men back in, in, in Minnesota, who had their fathers, but they were absentee, or they didn't spend time, or they, they, they abused them, whatever the situation, it caused them anger. The fathers affect the anger or lack thereof of the child the most, okay? The, the fathers. And what's going to happen, the Bible makes it clear that whatever you put into that child, that's what you get out of that child. That's the point. Yeah. I know, uh, I think there's that verse in Proverbs, maybe we'll see it. He talks about, uh, uh, he, he compares children to a quiver full of arrows, right? A quiver full. Guy has children and he takes that arrow out. Those arrows are dangerous weapons and you're supposed to shoot it. But the way you shoot it, it's like the things can come right back and get you. That's what, when a child is messed up and their father's provoked him to anger. By the way, look at verse 21. Lest they, so the possibility, be discouraged. You see that word discouraged? It's the opposite of encouraged. Um, in the Bible, Timothy. Timothy was a very timid man. The, the, the Timoth, young Timothy who Paul wrote to. Paul's son in the faith. We'll see that. And I am convinced, being part of, that part of his timidity, his in, being able to be intimidated easily, was the fact that his father wasn't who he was supposed to be. His mother had to lead the thing. His mother was his spiritual leader. We'll talk more about that later. His father was a Greek, Acts 16. His mother was a Jewish woman who taught him Paul. His mother and grandmother. Thank God for godly mothers and grandmothers. They're the second line of defense if the father doesn't do it. But they're, they're, not, the, they're not the first line. The fathers are. And Timothy, I can tell you, he was affected by his father's lack of spiritual leadership. It made him timid. It discouraged him. His courage was removed. His courage was removed. A father's supposed to instill courage. And what happened was, when Paul would say, I'm mindful of your tears, Timothy was easily discouraged. It says when he went out to the Corinthians, Paul told the Corinthians, deal with him that he might be with you without fear. They could be a rowdy bunch. And Paul says, no, be gentle with this young man. Help encourage him. He had been battling that because of his father. Now, go back to Ephesians chapter number 6. So a father is to be like God the Father in their child's life. The Bible says that God cares for and provides. He disciplines. He leaves a legacy and an inheritance for his children. We're going to see that, okay? He does all those things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says that the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Our job as fathers is to care for and provide and discipline. We're going to see what that discipline is in a moment. We're to leave a legacy and an inheritance to our children. That's what God has done. That's what God has done. That's right. When you get saved today, Romans 8 says, and if, and if children of God, then what? Heirs. Heirs of who? Heirs of God. Now watch this. And joint heirs with Christ, the son of the, 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 the head of the, the firstborn, if so be that we suffer with him, suffer with Christ. That is particular to the mystery that we might also be glorified together. Okay? So every believer today is an heir of God. Not every believer is a joint heir, equal share with Christ. Not every believer will reign with Christ. Only those who suffer with him in the mystery will. Okay? If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. 2 Timothy 2.12. So, but when you look at Heavenly Father, we fathers down here are supposed to do the same. Care for, provide, discipline, leave a legacy and inheritance. So, buddy, you got to get working on it. Got inheritance. All right. <laughs> hey, check it out. Funny, funny thing. Let me tell you about Jim. This man is a good man. It was funny, but Jim, Jim, Jim did this. Hey, leave my father alone now. Leave my father alone. Don't mess with my father. Right. Let me tell you something about Jim. Jim is such a good dad. He here, here's Jim. He has adult children, sons, and right at this moment, at this moment, I always say that because they're young. They're in their twenty. Are both of them in their twenties, Jim. Forty. 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 So young. Yeah. Okay. What things? Twenty-eight. Thirty-eight. Forty. Thirty-eight. Forty. Well, they need to get. I need. Boy, I need to talk to them boys. Okay. Well, thirty-eight. Forty. A couple years younger than me, both of them. One is one year. Well, Jim is such a good father. 
And he's, 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 he hasn't been perfect because he didn't teach him the grace message, but he's trying now, and that's what I want to remind you guys now. You can do it now. He doesn't have advantage that Jonathan and I have as fathers with younger children. Now we can teach him. But Joe and, and, and Jim, you guys, and, and, brother, and brothers out there who haven't, you know, Dorothy was lamenting today that her son, who's in his 60s, and it wasn't your, it wasn't your responsibility, Dorothy, it was your husband, Dick, but he basically said this, and I heard this over and over again in ministry. You know, Ron, we've taught that our child, our children from young children, now they're adults, we taught them denominational Christianity, unrightly divided word. Now as we try to teach them the rightly divided word, they're like, you taught me all the stuff I know now, and our grandchildren, your grandchildren know. Now all of a sudden you're changing everything, you're telling us about this new stuff. <laughs> and that's a hard thing to deal with. And there's you, only four in your group. I, exactly, you know. I mean, you've been going through the religious system with your children. Now they're grown. And now what you've taught them, they've taught your grandchildren. Now they all in the denominational system. And all of a sudden you come and say, that all was wrong. This is right. That's hard. I, I, I hear that all the time, okay? So so thankfully, Jonathan with young children, Benisa with young children, me with them. But for you guys who have adult children, don't, don't despair. You still can recover because right now you can start teaching them the grace message. But Jim is so kind, he's, he's, he's thinking about his children after the rapture. I gotta share this, Jim, it's just funny. <laughs> During the Q&A, Jim said, uh, you know what, when we go up at the rapture, will our bodies be back here? I said, no, they're gonna be changed, we're gonna go up. He says, because when I go, I wanna leave my sons everything I have, but they need a death certificate in order to get it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and we just crack it up, you know, it's just funny. And, um, but he's, he cares about it. He's like, well, they won't get my stuff, but they don't have a death certificate. Well, they won't have a death certificate. Because at the rapture, man, you're just going to change your body, you know. But your sons, they have a greater need than just your, your stuff. They need to yeah, trust the Lord Jesus Christ and grace message. And, and you need to do that while you're alive. What you're doing, they need to move back here from Washington and be part of the assembly with dad. That's what they need to do. Or at least start to learn from you as you send materials. They, they have the internet. Tell them to listen to the man that you listen to, Brother Ron, who, and then I'll make myself available as well. They don't want to take it from you. But that's what we're going to do. We'll talk more about that. But that's a kind father. He's thinking about his sons even after he departs. Fathers leave wills. Last will and testament. I give all I have to my children, particularly my sons and so forth, right? They did that in the Old Testament. Sons and daughters, if, if the man didn't have a son. All right. Fathers, we're called to be like God the Father to care for, provide, discipline, leave a legacy, and so forth. Now, this issue of discipline. <clears throat> Most people, when they think discipline, they think of spanking and punishment, right? Now, there is that, and, and it's not the woman's job to do it. It's the man's. It's the father's. It's not the mother's. It's the father's. Wait till your father gets home. Wait till your father gets home. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one phrase I hate. Because let me tell you, the wrath doesn't come down nearly as severe from the mother than it does the father. There needs to be that healthy fear, like the fear of God on that child. To just one look from the father, and you don't want him. Now, again, discipline doesn't all, only mean spanking <coughs> or punishing. We're going to see that there's some of that involved in a minute. But discipline really has to do with teaching and training. You know that? Right. Now, let's look at this. In the Bible, God taught the nation of Israel to teach their children the ways of God. When God gave Israel the law through Moses, Mo Moses recorded, and, and then they go through all these feast days, these festivals, these convocations, these holy convocations. They were rehearsals of the kingdom program, these seven feasts. And the children, all these strange things that happened, they had to prepare stuff this way. And the children say, I got a child, a five-year-old, who goes, why, Daddy, why, why? Everything, why, 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 why? Mm -hmm. And you tell her, you tell her, and she says, why? Because children are naturally curious, <clears throat> and as Israel would give, were giving these customs to their children, they were supposed to teach them to their children, and their children to their children, and children, 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 right? They were to go down the line teaching them the ways of God. We're going to see some, some of that. I love what Joshua says, as for me, everybody knows this, Josh, you know, you walk in somebody's house and they have these plaques, these little Christian plaques. They'll be Joshua, and they'll say, as for me and my house, we shall what? Serve the Lord, right? That's good, that's good. Different dispensations, but 
the, the, apple, the, the, the thought is good. That's what me and my house. See, Joshua is the man of the house says, hey, you guys in Israel can do what you want and serve Baal. He goes, if you want to serve Baal, serve Baal. You want to serve the Lord, serve the Lord. Pick a, pick a, pick a side, man. Stop, stop uh, halting. I, I got to get that verse. Let's, let's look at that. that. It's so profound. I don't want to miss it. Um, I didn't have it in my... Choose in, you to stay who you are. Yes, that's the one. Uh, was that Joshua chapter... You see the two, between two and four. Let's go look at it. You got Genesis... Actually got the law, then right after Deuteronomy, you have Joshua. Joshua takes him to the promised land. See if you can find that for me, uh, Ryan. Joshua, what? Oh, yeah. uh, Joshua. That's where it's for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. See if they can find that. Because that passage is, is fantastic. He just gets tired of Israel halting between just going back and forth. Right. He's like, make a make a make a decision. It's for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. See if I can. I'll be between two. Yes. Joshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus, yes. Huh. Jesus, they both mean Jehovah is salvation, yeah. Joshua is a type and shadow of the Lord Jesus taking Israel into the promised land. Exactly, uh, Jonathan. Moses, the law of Moses is not going to do it. Moses dies before he gets into the promised land. Joshua, Jesus takes him in. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, as it speaks about Joshua taking the people into Canaan, it calls him Jesus. Joshua is called Jesus in the book of Hebrew. Um, were you able to find that yet, Ryan? Yeah, uh, Joshua 24, 15. Yeah, that's it. Joshua 24. Please go there. <clears throat> Joshua is the head of his house. Joshua 24. You know, uh, in, in the book of Acts, Joshua 24. In the book of Acts, the Philippian jailer, you guys are familiar with that, right? Uh -huh. They beat Paul and Silas. The guy's going to kill himself because he sees the prisoners gone, but they, they don't run away. Paul's influence made it so they don't run away. Um, he's going to kill himself. And Paul says, hey, do yourself no harm. We're all here. Right. It was a brother in the Lord. He used to teach on that verse back in Chicago. And he'd read that verse. And he'd joke. He'd say, when Paul says, we are all here, he adds, save one. Save one. In other words, I'm out of here. You know, you're in prison. He'd always joke, if that was me, I'd have been gone. We're all here. Save one. You know, I never remember that. Anyway, and, and, what, and the guy said to Paul and Silas, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They didn't tell him to repent and be baptized like Peter says to Israel there at, at Pentecost. No. They said what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy what? House. And thy house. Because in that <coughs> culture, the father's faith was the one that the house honored. Yeah. So it was none of this... I'm going to have my faith and you and my wife and children are not going to, uh, no, no, no. That's, that's our culture. That, that didn't happen back there. Okay? Mm -hmm. You follow the faith of the Father. The faith, it's a song called Faith of Our Fathers, you know. Anyway, uh, look at Joshua chapter, was it 24? What verse? What, what was that? Uh, 15. 15. 24, 15. Oh, yeah, here it is. Here it is. Start at verse 14 where the paragraph up. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, Joshua says to Israel. Wow. You know what? He's, he's about to. This is the end of the book of Joshua, the last chapter. So he's like, hey, man, we're, we're going into the promised land. Let's just make a decision before we do this. What are we going to do? Verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Well, there you go. Fear the Lord. That's wise. There's some fear of the Lord's beginning of wisdom. And serve him in sincerity and in truth. They which worship him must worship him in and spirit and truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. So he's talking about That's on not clear, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, on the other side of the flood, the Noah flood, and then in Egypt, the Egyptian gods. And serve ye the Lord. Right. Now now watch the watch the beauty of what Joshua says. He was a rational man. He says, Look, man, I'm not forcing anything. I'm not Muslim. I'm not going to just force my religion on you. Well, we're going we gonna, to we gonna make a determination tonight. Verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. Some people, it's evil. Hey, I don't want to serve God. Fine. Choose you what day? This day. See, Joshua was real. People forget that every time Moses went up on Mount Sinai, it, it, this little excerpt to say, Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, was right there with him. Joshua, as like the Lord Jesus, he was always waiting in the wings with Moses, waiting right there. 
See, Joshua knew all that happened with Moses. He was right there. And Joshua knew, he, 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 he feared God. He was like, you know what, we're going in. When the 12 spies went over to Canaan and saw those giants, saw the land, how many of the 12 spies came back with a good report? One, two, three. Uh, one, two, three. He said one, two, three. Just count all the way up to twelve. Right now. <laughs> John was like, one, two, two, two three. Two. 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 Yeah. Okay. Just cover all of your bases. Yeah. For the unknown God, this altar's for you, whatever it is. <laughs> but if you like three, that's cool. Two. Who were they? Joshua and Caleb. Man, Caleb was in here. Man, he, they were like confident. God don't like, can I tell you, God don't like wishy-washy, man. He wants you to be a man. He don't like this wishy-washy. Let's just no, play the fence. No, just make up your mind. Make, just if you if if it's evil, serve Lord. Then go serve Baal. But if you're gonna let's do this thing, Joshua and Caleb says we're well able to do this. The other ones, ah, oh, no, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. Those are giants. We can't do it. Yeah, you can't do it. God's gonna do it. You know, when we get to Ephesians six about the part where we wrestle not against flesh and blood, this passage. Those passages where, where Israel goes into the promised land, their, their inheritance is a type and shadow of the body of Christ going to the heavenly places. And those giants are like the, the Satan and his angels and his principalities and powers. We don't wrestle them in flesh and blood. We do it with the power of the Lord, just like Joshua. And there's, a, there's a parallel between Joshua bringing them into Can and the Canaan and the Lord taking us into the heavenly places. It's the same thing. Okay? Now, verse 15. Joshua 24. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we might serve the Lord on occasion. We'll go on Christmas and Easter, get my foot in the church. We'll go there for a funeral or a wedding. No, no, no. We will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. That's the best thing Israel ever said in their life. God forbid. And you know what they did? They forsook the Lord and they worshiped other gods. Yeah, they meant well. Yeah. We walked around for 40 years. Yeah, exactly. These guys, these people could have went in there. So fathers, that's very important. So fathers will teach their children all through there. You know, I thought about, I, I was reading the book of Luke recently, and when we, we always talk about when Christ went down at 12 years old, and, and Joseph and Mary left him back, and he was in the temple, and he was like 12 years old, asking questions, answering questions, and, and, and they came back, they were all distraught, and like, son, we're, we're on our way back to Nazareth, and, and, and they had to go back, and they said, well, what are you doing? He goes, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? You remember that? But, but in Luke, 20, Luke 2, 41, it says that his parents took him to Jerusalem, took the family to Jerusalem every year. Joseph was a good, godly father because he taught his son Jesus and James and Joseph Jr. and Judah and his two daughters. He taught them the ways of God. He took them each year to Jerusalem for the feast days. Joseph, he led his family in worship of Almighty God. You couldn't have picked a better man than Joseph. That's why God picked him. Not much is known of Joseph, but that he was a just man. He loved God. He loved the Lord. He loved people. He, he, he could have had Mary stoned, made a public example, but he was just going to divorce her privately. He wasn't going to have her stoned. He was just going to have her put away privately. Didn't want to make a big deal. He loved that woman. He says, but she's having somebody else's child. I can't be with her. That was Can't do that in Israel. But the angel of God appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, that's God's child. You're the father. You're the stepfather. You're going to be the father that raises the son of God. That was a, Imagine God comes and says, Joe, <laughs> your name is Joseph. Joe, you're my man to raise my son. You'd be like, fear and trembling. Okay, Lord, you want me to do it? Yeah, do it right. Do it right. I'm talking about a shot. You know, Joe, do it and get it right, man. But obviously he did it right. Okay, and, and raised other godly men. Um, all right, it, it, including James who, and, and, and Judas, Judah, who wrote books of the Bible. Uh, what Joseph instilled in them, even though they were hard to believe in their own brother during his ministry, a prophet is not without honor except in his own home and amongst his own people, right? 
But even James, the brother of Jesus, and Judas, the brother of Jesus who wrote those two books, James and Jude, they, after the, after the resurrection, leave. Proverbs says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he gets older, he shall not depart from it. Don't think that Joseph's nurturing them and admonishing them as, a young, as young men, as their father, didn't lead to them then trusting their brother later. Joseph instilled some things, and I want to encourage those, instill these principles while they're young, and even if they go away, some do, that dynamic is that they come back to what was put in them, right? Mm -hmm. Whether good or bad. That's the problem, good or bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now. Back to Ephesians. Well, we, I, you know, I, I want to say this, you know, because we live, especially us in California, we live in a very liberal state uh, when it comes to, you know, corporal punishment. You know what corporal punishment is. A punishment upon the, the body, the court, court, the court. Well, God doesn't want you to abuse your children, obviously, right? Physically. But there's something to be said about putting the fear of God in there and put a little bit of uh, rod of correction on. We're going to look at that. So I'm going to let the Word of God say, first go to Hebrews chapter 12. Let me show you what the writer of Hebrews says to, to Israel. Fathers, it is our job to discipline, train up, and, and, and punish the, the, the children, not the, not the women. God has given us that grave responsibility. Let's just look at some of this. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Now, we saw this in our study of Hebrews, but just going to jump right into the context there. He's dealing with uh, he, uh, the, the writer of Hebrews, God is he's um, finishing up the book. He's concluding the book. Notice in verse 7, talking about their suffering for the truth. Verse 7, Hebrews 12, 7. If you, uh, in fact, in fact, go, go um, verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation, which speaketh unto you as unto children. Now, watch what the exhortation is from the word. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For, here's why, whom the Lord loveth, he what? Chasteneth. When we get to 1 Corinthians 11, Paul, Paul's going to talk about that as far as the body of Christ in a moment. But here's for Israel. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So what the word is saying is that as they go through this time here, it is a correcting, chastening time for the nation of Israel. And God is doing it out of love. Chris and I have watched shows where these Californians down in Southern California so lax in their parenting, they want to be friends with their children, cool, and drink with them and smoke with them. And these teenage girls are like, I just wish my parents would give me a spanking every once in a while. Fifteen-year-old girl said that. She was getting interviewed, and she's like, I do stuff, I do bad stuff to get attention because I want them to give me a spanking. I, in her mind, at least that would tell them they love me. How twisted. Yeah, well, I mean, she, what she wasn't getting was she wasn't being raised properly, Dorothy. She right. wasn't, her, her parents, they, they, had, they didn't have believe in corporal punishment. You know, put her in a time out. Did, no, sometimes we, we're going to see what, the, what they were missing was every once in a while, God has made a little chastening with the rod of correction. Right. That tells you that, look, verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, he tells Israel. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? I mean, in the Jewish religion, like, there's not a son. No man has a son and doesn't chasten his son. That's ridiculous. And by the way, if he didn't chasten his son, he doesn't love him. Look at the next part of that. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You're just illegitimate, born out of wedlock concubine boys. Or children of prostitutes. I mean, that was serious business. I mean, if you love your son, you'll chase at him. Verse 9. Watch this. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, talking about our earthly fathers, which corrected us. And we gave them what? Yeah, uh huh. Respect. Yeah, reverence and respect. Dad gets on that, and you say, Yes, sir, no, sir. You know. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Yes, sir. No more, no more. Thank you, sir. May I have another? But you know what happened? He put the fear of God in you. You thought about that the next time. Yeah. Look, they corrected us. 
We gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father's spirits and live? The writer of Hebrews is saying, if your earthly fathers correct you and, and get you and you reverence them, how much more your heavenly father as you go through this correction of the tribulation period? Now, let's go through some other verses as we look at this. Go, uh, so let's start back in Ephesians 6. All right, go back to Ephesians 6. Let me talk to you about what it means to nurture and admonish. Go back to Ephesians 6, and then we'll look at the verses about what this looks like in real life. Look at Ephesians 6 again. So now we'll have this for on record forever on YouTube. Anybody who will know how, what the word says about fathers, bam, we'll have it here. Look at Ephesians 6, verse 4. And ye fathers... Provoke not your children. Now notice here it says to wrath. Again, what's going to happen is that anger is going to be turned back on you. Uh, we saw this, this uh, we like these justice shows where they find murders where turns out this son killed his own father. By the way, the Mendez brothers and stuff, they, mm -hmm. th 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 those two boys here in California did that years ago. They claimed they were so angry at their parents, particularly their father, and they killed him. They were rich. We, we saw this show where the, the, this, this boy killed his father because the father had a, a farm, an inheritance. He had all this farm, and, and he, allowed, he, he had some illegal aliens from Mexico working the farm. And one of them was with him for a long time. And they found out that as, as their father aged, he got closer to the... So, so this one worker became a manager and, and like the household steward, right, of his, of his farm. And the boys were watching how this illegal alien from Mexico was becoming, over the course of 20 years, closer to their father than they were. Turns out they found out the father put that man in his will. That when the father dies, the farm and all the money, they were millionaires, would go not to his son, but to this man. Oh, yeah, they wasn't having it. They wasn't having it. So in some way, it turns out they killed their father. Their father provoked them to anger. Okay? Doesn't mean he can't give... The, the household manager, uh, the, the, the Mexican man, something, but you can see why these guys were so angry. You're our dad. You're giving your inheritance to somebody else. That drives you to wrath. Here it says, provoke not your children to wrath, but what's the opposite? Here's how you not provoke them to wrath, but bring them up. Now watch this, two things, in the nurture and what? Admonition of the Lord. What I like about this is because men are more powerful and strong, the tendency is mothers tend to, when they try to discipline, they be too lenient, whereas a father's tendency is to be too harsh, right? So it's this balance. But notice it says that when it comes to discipline, the first thing is nurture. So I was looking at this word nurture. It means the care and attention given to someone or something that is growing or developing. For example, you buy a little plant. Vanessa just bought this nice basil plant. She's watering it and doing some things. I told you, Ryan, his family too got that. So make sure we get some when he gets some. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan brings that fresh organic basil and this other thing. We make the pesto. So once that plant is done, we bring you some. But with that little plant or whatever it is, you start it off small or like a little animal or a little baby, you nurture it. It's to care and attend to something. In fact, the first time the concept is used is when God made the Garden of Eden. What does he tell Adam to do? He says, uh, he says, to dress and what? Keep it, right? To nurture it, work it. Well, that's what us fathers need to do. So the first thing God says is to nurture them. Nurture has a sensitivity connected to it. Nurture means to care and attend to something or someone as it is growing and developing. Yeah. It means to train it up, to bring it up, to nourish it with like food, you know, give it its, its food. And fathers are to provide food and spiritual food, physical food and spiritual food. I like this definition of nurture. The environmental factors influencing the behavior or traits of something. Get that. The environmental factors. So all the factors around that influence the behavior and traits. Do you know that your father, depending on how he raised you, he can influence your own behavior and, and, and your ways? Yeah, he can. Your father has a profound effect on the rest of your life, good or bad. 
nurture. Admonition. Paul uses this term admonition a number of times. Romans 15, 4. He says that we ought to be able to admonish one another. He says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, the things that happened to Israel were for our admonition and learning. It's for the body of Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, Paul says, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So there's that watch keep of the, of the ministers in the assembly. He says when you have to not deal with a brother because they're in some sinful lifestyle, he says don't count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And the last time admonishment is used is Titus 3.10, a man that is inherited, after the first and second admonition reject. Don't beat your head over the wall with somebody. Give them the admonition once or twice. Now what's an admonition? It is a criticism or warning about a behavior. An admonition is a criticism or warning of a behavior. Fathers are supposed to do that. You're supposed to take your son and say, come here boy, look here, let me tell you something about, about life. You know men remember what their father said? I hear grown men say, my, Brother James Mason, he says, Ron, my father said this, and I was 13 years old, and I remember it like it was yesterday. That was 50 years ago. Leonard Leonard says, Leonard, who's in his 60s, he says, Ron, my father told me this when I was 12 years old. I remember it like it was yesterday. He admonished him with life. So admonish means to criticize or warn about a behavior. But then it's to be done gently or friendly, a gentle or friendly reproof. It's not, boy, come over here, I'm going to bust you in your head because you ain't no family. It's, boy, let me tell you something about life. I'm your daddy. Listen to me. Here's the way it's going to be. It's a counsel or warning against fault. In other words, you're, you're, you're warning your son about life. Now, I want to go through some verses as we come down to end about fathers and their warning. The greatest warnings we can give our sons and daughters are spiritual warnings about you need to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to trust his word. And again, guys, if you hadn't done this as your children were younger... Well, you get to hurt your Well, it does, Jim, but you, you, it's, it, it, you, it, it's, it's not hopeless. What you need to do in a quiet and still of your heart is, Lord, I'm a grace believer now. And I'm, you repent. You say, I am sorry that in unbelief I raised those children. You better off not even having children. You don't bring children in this world to just make them another child of hell. You, 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 a, a father, a man is so responsible by Almighty God. You're the head, not your wife. You're the head. And when you choose, decide to conceive a child and buy, bring a child, God holds you responsible forever for that child. Now, because you sinned and you weren't a good father, you trust Christ. He takes that sin away. You've wasted time, but now you can redeem the time. So you as fathers say, Lord, I'm sorry I didn't raise my children right in, 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 in the Lord, like you say through Paul, but I want to do it now. And you do it. And you clear yourself so that stuff won't go to the judgment seat. And it is hard, Jim, once they're adults, but it's not impossible because the glory of children are their fathers, Proverbs 22, 6. Your sons still look up to you. They may be angry. They may be in unbelief. But they still, deep in their heart, have a spiritual connection. I, I'm 41. I have a connection to my father like no other. You want video proof? I hugged the man for 52 seconds when I met him. And it felt, I felt like a little boy for the first time. Crystal recorded it. That's a connection that no other person has on earth with me. He's my father. He wasn't there to be my daddy, but he's my father. He's my biological father. And there's nothing that's going to ever change that. That connection is eternal. Your, your children, people at 60, 70 years old are still seeking the approval of their fathers. Why would a 70-year-old work care about whether their father? It matters. It matters. So you guys still have a profound effect. Teach them the grace message now. Go to your sons. Go to your children. Say, I am sorry I was wrong. I raised you in the wrong doctrine. I didn't know better. I should have studied harder. I should have been more vigilant. Now I am. If you want to see, if you apologize to them for messing them up, messing the grandchildren up. Tell them, I'm sorry. I messed up. But I want to do right now. God will be with that. That's humility and repentance. Because God holds us responsible for the watch care, particularly spiritually. Now, 
As we come down in, let's look at some of these. Go to 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 11. If it is physically safe, let's say that you're divorced or separated. If it's physically safe for your children to be in the presence of their father, let them. If the man's in prison, let him visit him in prison. Let him talk to him on the phone. You gotta hear his voice. You gotta see him if you can. Spend time with him. All that matters. You think it, it matters, it matters, it matters. It's a, it's a spiritual thing. It matters, it matters. It matters. Well, look at 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 11. Paul, Paul was a spirit. There, there, we have fathers in the Bible. There's God the Father. There is our father Abraham, who faith we walk after. He believed God, Romans 4. There is Paul. He's our father. 1 Thessalonians 4. He's the one who begot us by the gospel. Okay? So fathers, have, there are different fathers. Men who have begotten you uh, leave a legacy. Abraham's faith. Paul's doctrine. His faithfulness. He calls Timothy. Timothy's father was a Greek man, Acts 16. <clears throat> but spiritually, Paul says, Timothy, you're, you're my son because you're served with me. Ultimately, sons serve with their father. That's what it means, doing the father's business, as it were. Timothy, my son who has served with me in the gospel. Okay? Look here. Paul was the spiritual father of these Thessalonians from the book of Acts uh, 17. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 11. As ye know how we, what, exhorted and comforted and charge, the father is to exhort, to comfort, and charge every one of you as a father doth his, what, children. You have to exhort, comfort, and charge. That. That, yeah, thank you, Dorothy. Here's the purpose, right? That ye would walk worthy of God, who have called you into his kingdom, but not just his kingdom, as heirs, not just getting into the kingdom, and to his what? Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Those are what you be, that's what it means to be a joint heir. Oh, Brother Ron, all that matters is we get to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God's will is that all men be saved. There's their heavenly inheritance. And coming to knowledge of the truth, there's more. He's speaking of the heavenly kingdom. Yes, the heavenly kingdom. But not just getting into the kingdom to share his glory reigning with Christ. That's what it means to be a joint heir. That's what Paul is talking about there. Now, let's look at a few songs as we end. we got about 10 minutes. Um, oh, go back to Genesis 18. I love this one. One day, Ryan and I, during a Q&A, we were talking about the law. Did you know that God was given his law before? He was giving out his laws before Mount Sinai. Think about something. From Adam to Moses, how did people deal with God? Or how did, better yet, how did God deal with people? God was sharing his word with Adam. He was sharing his word with Abraham. Like Enoch walked with God, Noah. But I want you to see something about the laws that God gave to Moses. He was giving them to Abraham. Just didn't write them in tablets, but he was talking to Abraham. Watch this. Go to Genesis chapter number 18. Genesis 18. When, when, when God is about to uh, check, check out uh, Ron Wyatt Sodom and Gomorrah he finds the <coughs> Sodom and Gomorrah when God is about to rain down fire and brimstone in his wrath at Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities round about <coughs> Zolon and Zemboam and all them right off the eastern the, the western coast of the Dead Sea he tells Abraham what he's going to do, and, and he, he also warns Abraham's nephew Lot. Okay? Because what God does is he warns you before he does something. His wrath. He, he's gracious that way. He says, hey, I'm going to blow, blow this place up with some That's fire and brimstone. That's what the Jews are doing today. And you know where they got that from? The scripture. Right. That's right. Ryan and I were talking about the dynamic of the Hebrews. Even though they're lost, they have the Old Testament tradition come down and before they bomb a place right. they put down flyers and right. say we're going to bomb this place in 15 right. minutes get out of here you can see them these little thousand people picking them up they have thousands of flyers they write them in Hebrew they write them in Arabic they, so the Jews are kind you, you think the Muslims say hey in about 10 minutes we're about to bomb this place no no, no. <laughs> Israel does well God does that he says hey I am going to pour out my wrath on these cities right but he tells people who love him. Notice this. 
First, first. In, 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 in uh, Genesis 18, look at verse 17, if you will. 18, 17. Verse 16. And the men rose up, so these are the angels, from thence, and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. So here's the angels of the Lord. Verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? So there's three men. What I believe it was the Lord, in, uh, a pre incarnate Christ, and a couple of angels. He has a counsel with them. He says, Look, should I hide from Abraham what I do? See, God has, he, he's, he's, he's that way. He counsels all through time. Should I, he talks to them. Should, should I hide from him? Now watch this. Um, verse number 17. The Lord says, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? And here's why he asked the question, verse 18. Seeing that Abraham shall what? Surely become a great and mighty nation. You know why God? God knew Abraham's faith and God was going to fulfill his covenant with Abraham. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Talking about that kingdom and so forth. Oh, but look at verse 19. Men, don't you want God to say this about you? Watch this. Read this verse about 50 times as a father. For I know him that... He will command his children and his household after him, and that they shall keep the way of the who? The Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken. I, I want you to see that Abraham did the justice and judgment. Uh, you know what, Ryan? I'll have you find this as we come down to end. Uh, find the one where he talks about my laws. And stuff. Genesis 26, 5. Thank you. 26, 5. Go to 26, 5. That's it. That's it. Brian is right on, isn't he? Uh, 26 5. The covenant master. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. He follows you right along. Check this out. Oh, yeah. He's the puppet master. No, I'm the puppet master. Ryan's the puppet. That's what I'm going to say. I control him. He does it. He says it does everything I say. I said, maybe because, you know, we're one mind, one accord, because we've studied the, the, the word of the Yeah. Grace uh, my uh, life. Laurel. She turned around like this. Oh, you just gotta agree with anything Ron says. <laughs> like, you, like, and Ron, we're like, uh, because you know, we have one yes, mind and the Lord. That's the beautiful thing, the way you guys work yeah. together. That's right? how the body works. That's Paul says, "Be of one mind." One you right. know, I believe Paul's message. So does Ryan. We study it together and, and dig these things out, and then, lo and behold, we come to see some things the same. Wow. That's right. She just thinks he is a robot and does whatever I say. You know. It's crazy. <laughs> Ryan, get the verse. No, it's good. <laughs> Thank you. He has that little bit. He's fast. Okay, here we go. 26.5. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge. Now watch this. My commandments, my statutes, and my what? Laws. All those same terminologies used for the law of Moses. He gave the moral law there, Ten Commandments. He gave certain statutes to, to, for the civil running of the nation and so forth. I'm telling you what God was revealed all the way back to Adam. He was revealing his word. Now, he only he codified it through the, the tablets and so forth, through Moses writing it. But notice, Abraham, 400 and plus years before Moses, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws, right? That's neat. That's fantastic. That's great. And he knows that if Abraham's going to do it, Abraham will teach his sons, Isaac and Jacob. Right. No, excuse me. Um, Ishmael, he did teach Ishmael. Ishmael was, by the way, Ishmael was um, circumcised after the covenant. Ishmael was going to be blessed by God. We have nations and princes. He, he told Hagar, you all know that, right? Okay. That's where he is today. He's just not the promised seed. He's not the one Messiah is going to come through and get the king. Okay. We got, we got him down to the end. I want you to show these, these passages are right there in Psalms and Proverbs real quick. We'll, we'll give me about five minutes. Go to Psalm 71. I just wanted to show you some things. Psalm 71. These are just some nice little tidbits of, 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 of wisdom. And, and, and these are things that are interdispensational principles. These are, you know how God gave Moses the law, but he had given it pre-law. These are just common principles of God. Go to Psalm 78, verse 4. Psalm 78, verse 4. Yeah. Um, speaking about the Word of God, we will, verse 4, we will not hide them from our children, from their children. Okay, so the psalmist says, you know what? God's going to give Israel children for, for generations. And God, you give us your word, and we won't hide it from them. 
Uh, verse number uh, four. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he have done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their what? Children. children that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born. They're talking about children who are not even born yet. <laughs> they're going to be born, they're going to know the word. Who should arise and declare them to their children. But wait, there's more. That they might set their hope in God and, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And might not be as their father, stubborn and rebellious. Can you see that? Fathers, our job is to teach our sons and daughters the word of God so that then they can teach theirs and so forth and so on. God wants us to have children so we got more members of the body of Christ, grace believers, until he come. That's the only reason to have children. Um, Proverbs. Hmm? Oh, Jonathan knows that. That's why he's here leading his family. Praise. Jonathan is actually doing that younger than I. He's young. Yes, he's young. He's only 20, 27, right? Almost. Almost 26. Perfect, man. I, I wish he was more a young man like this, who leading his wife and children in these things. Man, praise. Because he has to believe it. His wife believes it. His children. You don't man, you, you're doing it, man. You just keep what you're doing, what you're doing. Proverbs chapter 4. Yeah, he, Jonathan is an example of a, of a young grace believer who's leading his family. He's doing what the Lord, he's, he's doing what the Lord desires him to do. You know. That, that's very rare to be that young and being a grace believer, period. Let alone leading your family in it. You know. We thank God for it. Well, the biggest thing is thankful that his wife is willing. You know, because you could be young and be a grace believer and your spouse not willing, and then you, you've got problems. Uh, Proverbs 4, look at verse 1. Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. The children are supposed to be instructed and, and learn from their father. For I give you good doctrine. Now today is Paul's doctrine. Forsake ye not my law. Today it's grace. For I was with my father. For I was my father's son, Solomon says. He says, David taught. By the way, David taught Solomon. Tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. That was Bathsheba. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and what? Live. live. That's that, that it may be well with thee, and thou livest long in the earth. David taught Solomon the word. Uh, as we come down here, I'll give you a couple more verses. You, you know that provoke your children around? David, he taught Solomon the word. Solomon was a good king. Now Solomon, Solomon, he backslid as it were his appetite for women interesting that David's appetite for, for, for ladies affected his sons uh. it brought his son down for a time Solomon recovered himself the book of Ecclesiastes he says fear God keep his commandments he says I'm going to tell you young guys fear God keep his commandments that's the whole duty of men uh, Ecclesiastes 12 but the fact is David his, 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 his sin affected his son Absalom well if you read about Absalom oh boy you go and read about Absalom. Absalom was against his father. David provoked him to wrath with his conduct. Oh, it was bad. Okay? And so forth. Jonathan, the son of Saul, who was David's soulmate as a male, once old. Jonathan one day, I was reading this today. Jonathan was so hated by his father, his father threw a javelin at him, threw a spear at him, tried to kill him. He said, he says, boy, I know you on David's side. You're going to be the next king of Israel, whether you like it or not. And if you fight against me, you know the son of Jesse's going to be this. And Jonathan was like, because God said David should be father. I'm not the next king. God ordained David. And a, and a javelin comes. Jonathan said, my dad don't love me, man. I'm out of here. He, I'm telling you. And Jonathan made his life's mission to get David to be the king, like God says, and go against his father provoked him. See, this stuff is real. Okay. Keep, keep looking at a couple more. Look at Proverbs 19, verse 18. Proverbs 19, 18. Proverbs 19, 18. We're almost done. Just want to give you these, get these on, 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 this, on the lesson. Oh, remember I was talking about discipline is not just spanking and stuff. It's training. Train up a child. But it is some, some getting, getting a little corporal. Verse 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope. Okay. And let not thy soul spare for his what? 
Crying. Crying. That's why ladies can't do it, right? Yeah. That's why y'all women can't do it. It's crying. She's, mm -hmm. I don't care. Don't. God would say, as Israel's punished people, don't let your eye pity. Women, y'all let your eye pity. You let you spare because of crying. God tells the man, don't do it. Let him cry. Get him. Keep reading. This is God's word. Look at verse chapter 22, verse 6. I almost going to throw this one in there since I quoted it. Look at 22, verse 6. Yep. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That is the standard rule as you teach him. Verse 15. <laughs> I love this one. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. You ever seen a little baby? <laughs> so cute. So sweet. Yeah. You know what's in that little heart? <laughs> yep. Foolishness. Oh, Judge Judy says society is just a bunch of, of uh, uh, what she call them? Beasts that need to be tamed or something. <laughs> she, they come into a courtroom 40 years. You, you got to tame them little beast, right? Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. It's all wound up in there. Oh, Lord, how do we get rid of foolishness? But the rod of correct, correction shall what? Drive it far from them. Yeah. You give a little rod of correction, that just takes all that foolishness against God out of there. Yeah. Uh, two more. Uh, chapter 29, look at verse 15. Chapter 29, verse 15. Oh, I love this one. <laughs> you love them all. <laughs> now, some children are more difficult than others. I was a good little boy. I only probably had to have two or three spankings. You know? Personality plays a lot. Ooh. You need to pray for a nice, nice mild-mannered child because the boy, they personality. Some children need a little bit more. Me and Krista and Krista's older brother, Gary, her parents like Krista and Gary never even needed a spanking. They were so sweet. But their younger brother, Andrew, he was a... <laughs> That dude got a spanking every day, man. <laughs> Looks like Jada Lynn. Not that far like Uncle Andrew, but you know, she's, she a, boy, she's a firecracker. Okay, now watch this. 29, that's just personality, 15. The rod and reproof give what? Wisdom. A, a little rod of correction and tell them what to do. They'll learn some wisdom. But a child left to himself, oh, a child left himself bringing his mother to what? Shame, Shame yeah. Son, daughter, I'm just going to be your friend. Whatever you want to do. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's going to bring you shame. Yeah. Verse 17. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Don't let this boy just continue in his foolishness. Correct him. You know, you got to deal with them. <laughs> Next week, we're going to see as we continue. We're going to pretty much end the session of Grace in the Home. We're going to move, or well, tonight we are, we're going to move into grace and society. Now, he's going to talk about servants next week. In the Roman Empire in Paul's day, servants were a real thing, not slaves. Next week, we're going to see slavery is, is a sin worthy of death in the eyes of God. Men stealing, it's called. Because I know back in the day, some of the white men called themselves Christians. They tried to justify slavery with the word. That's just some nonsense with shenanigans. Slavery was never ordained of Almighty God. It was, it was an abomination, both under law and under grace. It was punishable by death. All those men who used that as, as the reason to have slaves, they're going to deal with it. If they were saved at the judgment seat, if they were lost at the great white throne, that was, they, they deserved death, the Bible says. God said. Servanthood, servitude, like an indentured servant, that was ordained in Scripture because if you owe somebody something... That was the seven years. Well, it was a lot different. Uh, this is a different one. So for Hebrews and then with the Romans and the Greeks, they have different ones. My point is, there was a place in society for servanthood, particularly because you owed somebody a debt. You had to pay it off. The closest equivalent for us today is employment. You go to a job, you labor for them, then they give you money in return, right? So it's close to that, very close. Uh, so we'll see that, okay? We'll see that next week. Yeah, we'll see that next week. Okay. All right. If you're listening today and you never had anyone love you enough to ask you if you were to die today, do you know for sure you're going to spend eternity? I love you. These saints here in NorCal Grace love you. That's why we have this ministry. But more importantly, God loves you. And God sent the Apostle Paul in Romans 5, verse 8 to say, to write, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
You don't have to move a muscle, pray a prayer, go to church, give a tithe. You don't have to do anything to be saved. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your faith and trust. Rely exclusively upon Him. God will save you this moment forever. He'll forgive you all your sins. Christ took them upon Himself. He took the wrath of God. And He died in your place if you trust Him. Okay? That's the way you get it. Unto all and upon all them that believe. you got to believe on the Lord Jesus. Okay? Now, if you do that, you have all sins forgiven. God will never count a sin against you that will keep you out of heaven. Put you in hell. You get dealt with. You're done. Where your sins or lack of good works come in is for your reward. The sins that follow you is based upon your reward or lack thereof, 1 Timothy. Now you want to limit the sin through the Spirit of God and sanctification process, the work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope. God will cleanse you up through His Word as you believe it. That's what the good works and so forth are all about. It will be fruit abounding to your account. So if you just got saved or you are saved, if you're a father today, redeem the time teaching your children the, the, the rightly divided word. If they're, if they're adults, if they're not willing, that's between them and God. Always constantly, though, know that they, have, they, they love you as a father, even though they say they don't. They do. You influence them, even though they don't, you don't, it doesn't look like it. You do. God says it. Teach them the truth. Apologize for not teaching the truth. Now say, I want to teach you the truth. We'll be praying for you. God will work with that. All those things work to your glory at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll help you with that. Okay? All right, let's pray. Oh, by the way, mothers, <clears throat> next week we'll see what if the fathers don't do it? Where do mothers come in? We'll see that next week. We'll start the first session, first section of that session, talking about if the father doesn't do it, what if a mother desires to do it, where she fits in? We'll look at that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you for his uh, wonderful, precious sacrifice of Calvary's cross. Oh, Father, let us never, ever, ever not appreciate, not exalt, not glorify, not be at awe and wonder of what he accomplished on that cross. How his soul was made a made an offering for sin, how he was that perfect sacrifice, how his shed blood was our propitiation, our fully satisfying payment, Father. Amen. May us, may we never forget that. That the whole reason we can even pray to you as we're doing now corporately is because of what Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, done for us on the cross. His death, his burial, his resurrection. Father, let us remember that in Christ we're members one of another. We're not just members of his body and his bones and his flesh. But we're members one of another. May we always appreciate the fellowship we have one with another. And never take that for granted either. Um, there are many saints, stranded grace believers, who don't have this. Some move here. They, 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 they appreciate and, and uh, value and esteem this fellowship uh, that much. We pray in these last days more people have that desire and, and, and that willingness and that profound willingness to just give up all that's back there and come here be a part of what you're doing in these last days which is the greatest thing well Father we thank you for this time together as we uh, in this session have a, a, a Q&A together we give you thanks and praise in Christ's name